sage grouse uh, is, is often described as kind of a gray chicken-like bird, but it's much more than that. Uh, there's a considerable difference between in size between males and females. Uh, males are, are almost twice the size of a female sage grouse, and, and during the spring, during the breeding season, they may reach, reach weights of almost eight pounds. They are the largest, outside of the turkey, the largest upland game bird in North America. They are the third largest game bird in the world. Sage grouse is commonly view, viewed as an umbrella species, and in fact, the health of sage grouse populations uh, likely reflects the status and the health of other species that are dependent upon sagebrush. This would include pronghorn, mule deer, pygmy rabbits, sage thrashers, and a variety of other game and non-game species. Currently, sage grouse occupy parts of 11 western states and two Canadian provinces. They occupy and are entirely dependent upon our sagebrush uplands or sagebrush steppe. Uh, during the winter, the only thing sage grouse eat are the leaves and buds of sagebrush plants. So without sage uh, brush, we will not have sage grouse. It's very simple in, in that respect. The threats vary depending on the actual location of, of the, the grouse population, but in general there are two major threats that, that sage grouse face. One is a habitat loss and fragmentation, that is the breaking up of large blocks of habitat into smaller and smaller pieces due to wildfire and the invasion of uh, various plant species, most notably cheatgrass, that provide fine fuels and result in more wildfire. The, the, the second uh, uh, big threat to sage grouse is the uh, uh, proliferation, the development of uh, oil and gas uh, energy related infrastructure, which uh, especially in, in places like Montana and Wyoming have had uh, uh, very significant effects on sage grouse. There are also some sage grouse populations that are heavily impacted by, disne by disease, mostly it's West Nile virus, which sage grouse team simply don't seem to be able to, to defend themselves against. Uh, and, and we've seen in, in some areas, including parts of Oregon, uh, fairly major die-offs due to West Nile virus. The great reason, or one of the large reasons for sage grouse uh, uh, <coughs> being considered a candidate for listing under the Endangered Species Act is that the populations range-wide have declined precipitously since at least the 1960s. Um, we're, we're talking a reduction in overall range of almost 50 percent and some of the uh, more recent analyses have ind indicated uh, range-wide these populations are declining at a rate of about 2 percent per year. So an example of how they might protect what's left would be by developing fire breaks that would reduce the size or even the chance of wildfire in sagebrush steppe. Uh, a nice example of how they might be fixing what's broken is by going in and removing stands of juniper uh, which are invading our sagebrush steppe and uh, juniper uh, tends to provide uh, uh, perching platforms, nesting sites for things that eat sage grouse and or sage grouse eggs. So grouse tend to avoid tall structures and, and so that's a very, it's kind of a low hanging fruit but it's, it's, a, it's a quick, relatively quick uh, conservation action that can be taken to hopefully show short-term benefits. Backcountry Hunters and Anglers is a conservation group. We want to protect our wild lands, our waters, and the outdoors in general. And we've been uh, proactively involved in sage grouse uh, conservation by helping remove some of the juniper trees which they don't like, uh, specifically in the Heart Mountain area uh, with the antelope preserve in the Heart Mountain. Oregon was very proactive in this regard uh, when uh, the threat first came out that the bird could be listed uh, by the Fish and Wildlife Service. Oregon uh, took that very seriously. Uh, at former Governor uh, Kitzhaber's request and directive, uh, a group called Sage Con was formed. And Sage Con brought together over 30 diverse groups, environmentalists, conservation groups, hunters, anglers, uh, scientists using the best available science that we could use to implement this and they've come up with a great plan and we're part of that uh, a draft plan which will be released in June um, uh, to address conservation values around the sage grouse. Now the state effort is unique it really truly is because without a state effort uh, coupled with a BLM effort uh, we wouldn't be addressing the entire opportunity to conserve sage step out there. 
But the fact that we're in front of it and proactively addressing this area, there's a lot of, of optimism that we can bring the numbers back and uh, hopefully prevent a listing. And uh, because a listing would be good for, for no one, it'd be an entire new set of regulations that we would have to jump through, hoops to jump through that we don't even know what would be required at this point because there's no plan for that. The plan is to get in front of it now and make a difference. Well, the health of the sage grouse, the health of the whole environment and the, the system out there, the steppe. Uh, we're talking about 15 million acres in southeast Oregon. That's a lot of range. Uh, if the sage grouse is healthy, so is the mule deer. So are elk that come down from the high hills and seek uh, shelter in the, in the desert in the wintertime. Uh, so are antelope. Uh, they're healthier. It, it just helps the whole system. Plus, it helps cattlemen. Cattlemen have been there for 170 years in southeast Oregon. And when the, the, the system is healthy, so are the grasses, so are the forbs, so is the grazing capacity and ability. So what affects the sage-grouse affects everything behind it. And if we can bring the sage-grouse back to health, then we have a much healthier desert in Oregon.